Hi, welcome to my show, Enlightenment. I am Doc Honeycutt. Thank you for joining me today. On my show today, I have a really awesome guest, and I think we just kind of share a, a common interest because I'm a biker. He was a biker. I'm doing a documentary film. He's done a documentary film, and I just wanted to bring him here so. Um, he could tell us, you know, just about what gave him the drive to do the movie that he that he's done. It's called The Black Beach, White Beach. But um, before I introduce him, you know, like I said, we share a common interest. And, you know, me and myself, I haven't been a doctor all my life. But prior to me becoming a doctor and growing up, at, um, you know, I would go to the bike rallies at Atlantic Beach. And all I can remember was fun, 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 fun. Can I say fun? <laughs> and you know, and I looked at his film and it just kind of took me back to, you know, my teenage um, years. But I'm gonna, um, I'm not gonna hold you, you know, hold you. I would just want you to um, listen to his story. And this is Mr. Ricky Kelly. How are you doing tonight? Great, Doc. How are you? I am doing awesome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. So you got this film. Tell us what inspired you to do this film. Well, just going to the bike rally for um, the past 20 years or so, going to both bike rallies. Uh, well, the first 10 years or so, I was just going to Black Bike Week. And then I had a Caucasian friend um, invite me to uh, White Bike Week. And when I got there, the stark differences were just, they just jumped right out at you. I was like, wow. They get to do whatever they want to down here, you know, and this is not the case when we go. Um, so um, over the years of going, I always felt that there was a story there that something that, you know, people needed to know that, you know, we aren't being treated as we should be. We're not, our dollars aren't being appreciated. Um, so I, I just wanted to tell the story. And also there's a rich history in Atlantic Beach, which is where it all started at. You know, a lot of people don't know that you know, Atlantic Beach is, was like one of the last black beaches in America. And this is where my parents used to go because they couldn't go to Myrtle Beach. They couldn't go to any white beaches. So um, during desegregation in 1968, after that, now prior to 68, um, Atlantic Beach was, was thriving. You know, it was a, it was a rich community, a black community. Um, they had everything uh, on the strip that you could imagine. Uh, won the wheel, just, uh, it was just a lot of fun. And it was, you know, our beach. They called it the Black Pearl. And after 68, you know, desegregation, we could go to other beaches. We could go to Myrtle Beach now. So it kind of lost this, you know, black people left our black beaches and went to experience Myrtle Beach. And there's nothing, there wasn't anything wrong with that, but the problem was they never came back in the numbers that they did. So the community itself, which is Atlantic Beach, has been kind of struggling to stay up and, you know, trying to refine the heyday of um, black bike. So yeah, you talked about um, the difference. Now I, you know, like I said, I would go to Atlantic Beach and it was like there was no need to even go to the other side because you know the fun was right there in the heart of Atlantic. I remember you know there was one road, you know a lot of hotels, some hotels even had like rooftops where you could go on them and, and set chairs up and just party on the rooftop. Right. Now do you remember that? Yeah the patios yes. Okay so looking at your film I saw, you know, a lot of the guys that, that owned the hotels there. I think it was Mr. Evans. And, I, you know, and I'm like, oh, God, I remember. You know, it was like, it just took me back to, you know, like I said, to my um, my bike rally days with, you know, with my mom. Now, when I got a little bit older, you know, it was different. You know, she stopped going. You know, we were going on our own because we had motorcycles then. And that's when I could, like, see the change. You know, like I said, streets blocked off. You know, we talked about the, um, what was that, um... The 23 mile 23 traffic. 23 mile, loop. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, now they've implemented a, a, a traffic pattern, a 23 mile traffic loop, um, which is to deter 
us from coming. They block off all the roads for 23 miles. And once you get in this traffic pattern, you can't get out of it. It's like if you don't, if you can't prove that you stay in this hotel or that you live on this street right here, you have to keep driving. And it takes like four hours to go 23 miles. Now, motorcycles need air induction to keep their engines cool. Mm -hmm. And it, you're at a snail's pace, so there's no riding. It's a lot of pushing your bikes for miles, basically. You know, for the people that's been caught in this traffic loop, understand, you know, it's just deadlock traffic, you know. And it's unfair, and I think it's unconstitutional, and that was one of the things that frustrated me into um, making this film, you know, showing the world that, look, if you're going to install this traffic loop for us, you should install it for them as well. So let's talk a little bit about the, the filming process. Where did you, um, like, you know, you, you thought, you got this vision, this great vision, I'm going to do a film. So after you got the vision, you know, how did you start putting things into action? Well, my, my wife and I were sitting at the, at the table. And, well, I could go back even further. What, what inspired, I, I went to St. Augustine's University. Um, in Raleigh, I was a communications major, but I never really worked in my field. And but I always wanted to, and I'm a big fan of documentary filmmaking. So, um, but I didn't have the experience. I was watching a documentary called um, Twelve O'clock Boys, and it's about motorcycle ride. Those guys that ride the little uh, that block off traffic, and you see them doing it a lot today yeah. on the four wheelers and the dirt bikes. And uh, I thought it was beautifully shot, but what, what, what inspired me was like, I felt like I could do this. I'm like, you know, if I had a vision, I said, if I do it, I want it to look like this. And I think I can do it. And I told my wife and she said, you know, the great woman she is, shout out to Cherie Kelly, you know. <laughs> shout out, uh, Cherie. <laughs> she uh, said, we can do it. And she, you know, helped me um, bring my vision to fruition. But it was a long time coming because when I first started, I thought, oh, I'm going to go down to the bike rally. Well, I wrote out the story, and I knew what I wanted to convey to the people. I know the story that I wanted to tell, but I didn't realize how long it would take. I thought, well, I'd go down to the bike rallies, to the White Bike Week one week, and, you know, the Black Bike Week the next, film that, do some interviews, and then I have the movie by the end of the summer. Well... Four years later, we just finished <laughs> because it, you know, I, I knew that it took a lot more than that, but I just didn't, you know, know how. So I reached out to some people that were making films. Christopher Everett, the uh, director of um, Wilmington's on Fire, I reached out to him and he was like, Whatever you need, brother, I'll, you know, help you. And that's why I was, you know, of course, I, I told you that I would help you with yes, whatever, you whatever you needed, yes. you know, because we have to help each other. You know, and, and, and lift each other up, you know, because this isn't something that, you know, we're on the East Coast. This isn't Hollywood. This isn't, you know, California. This is North Carolina. So it's a small group of filmmakers, you know, and we have to stick together and, 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 and bring content. So um, Christopher Everett, thank you. Shout out to him and Speller Filmworks. They, he, he gave me advice, and I just took the idea. I went down the first year shot it and me and my wife just me my wife and her nephew that's my <laughs> friend my cameraman and i just wasn't really happy with the the i knew that i had to do the story justice and i had to present it mm -hmm. in a way that you know would make the people down there that i'm telling this story about proud i didn't want to just do a little janky documentary that you sell out your trunk you know, I wanted to do, I had big visions. I wanted to do film festivals. I wanted to be, you know, recognized as a filmmaker. So um, a lot of money went into it, a lot of time. Uh, I sold my bike. She said when we started, I used to ride. No, I mm -hmm. ride. I just sold my bike to make this film. You know, I put mm -hmm. everything we had into bringing this film to fruition. And I didn't do it for the money. I did it to tell the story and honor my ancestors. And he's going to get a bike when he gets his deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And a plot of land in Atlanta Beach. <laughs> because they, they need it. They need yes. us. And I hope this film brings attention to Atlantic Beach because they're struggling right now. There's no infrastructure. And, you know, um, we don't know about the place. So if we go down and we buy land and, and maybe we can bring it back to uh, to where it was back in the day. Do you think we could do it? 
I mean, because like I said, there were hotels everywhere. And there were, you know, like little open clubs, like clubs like this, just open. You go in and, you know, buy your drink and you dance and you listen to music. But it's, I mean, it's just so bare now. You know, it's just, it's nothing there anymore. So if, if you know, we could get it back to where it was and, you know, get everybody to migrate back on that end, I'm in. Right. I am in. Well, I, I, I want to give a, sh also, I want to uh, talk about the people that started uh, uh, Black Bike Week. Well, the Atlantic Beach Memorial Day Bike Festival is the proper name for the event. And it was started in 1979-1980 by a club called the Carolina Night Riders. And they just wanted to throw an event for the veterans that came home from, you know, past wars and whatnot. And they just wanted to do something special for them. And the first bike week had 200 people there. And over the years, it spawned up to now like a half a million people, 350,000 if the weather's bad, 500,000 if, if, if it's good weather for the weekend. But it's an incredible event. And, you know, I think a lot of people that come there that don't know about it need to ride up to Atlantic Beach, spend your money up there. You know, those people, they are trying to live off that money that they make that, they make that one weekend out of the year. So, um we we have to um, come back and, and, and pay homage to, to our ancestors. But you know, um, all honesty, Myrtle Beach don't want us down there anyway. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I don't, I always stay in North Myrtle Beach, always, you know, in Atlantic. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, I think you've lost like a few people that actually, that was in your documentary film. Um, then a couple of people that never right. died. I, right, we, we, yeah, it was, um, a couple of people that have spoke on camera, um, shout out to uh, the Rough Riders for giving us access, Wah, and, and uh, they lost a rider, they lost, um, I mean, riding is a dangerous sport, you know, and um, every year, we, we all know if you ride long enough, you're in a club, somebody's not going to make it, but uh, there was a, a few people that were in the film, a couple people that were in the film that are not with us today, but I think what... Another thing that inspired me to make this movie as well was the loss of one of my best friends. One of the guys that I used to go down there with, Jawain Burnett, uh, rest in peace, he was like my little protege. We used to go down to Myrtle Beach and wild out, you know, the bike rallies. And he used to listen to me vent on the way back, you know, in the <laughs> truck or something, you know, towing the bikes back about how, why are they treating us like this? Why are we having to go through this? You know, why is this police harassment so bad, you know? And I used to tell him, one day I'm going to do a story about this. One day I'm going to make a movie about this. And he just listened, yeah, we Rick, Rick do it, right? So, I ain't telling this part. But uh, he he passed. And, you know, he's 40 years old. Had his first son. And it, you know, inspired me. It was like, well, in honor of him, you know, and the times that we had, I did what I said I was going to do. And I made this film. Mm -hmm. And it's an awesome film, and I'm in the credits. But we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to hear some more from Mr. Ricky Kelly. How about that? There are two events in Myrtle Beach, Harley Week and there's Black Bike Week. One event is welcome and one event was not welcome. The Atlantic Beach Memorial Day Bike Fest started in 1980. We drew 250 people. Atlantic Beach was born out of segregation. We used to have Jane Brown, Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell. They used to come to the beach area and play at the nightclubs in Myrtle Beach. But during segregation, they had to live and eat in Atlantic Beach. The Harley is an older group of people that come to Myrtle Beach. We'll probably have a couple thousand to three thousand bikers during this week. What about uh uh, Black Bike Week, the following week, do you, what kind of numbers are you expecting for that? And 300 plus thousand. 
when black bikers came to town, they were arrested for minor infractions. For far too long, these events have been separate and unequal. That's what it is. Appreciate y'all, Myrtle Beach. Come on! One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two three, four. Get up. Get on up. Get up. Get on up. The culture's going to be beginning if their world's apart. I think uh, Myrtle Beach is a power day because of the people who may come to town that just say they ain't going to take it. You're worried about that 23 mile loop, aren't you? A little bit. Uh, I don't see why. Like prisoners, you know what I'm saying? You know what it is, man. They're trying to keep the damn animals, you know what I'm saying? This is no longer a law enforcement issue. Our law enforcement was stellar. We had more than enough people. 273 we sent from the state. See, Harley actually started in North Myrtle Beach back in the 50s. They're starting to age out. We heard it's going to be smaller this year. When you get a car, you get tours, you get money in the city, you're going to get crime. That's just the fact that if you're going to go one bike with that way, you all bike with that way. We, we the same people that y'all had last week. We just a different culture. So why do y'all do this to us? We have more crime jail fourth week than we have black bike week. It's just a small symptom of what's going on in the bigger picture. But we're not going to navigate it with bike loops, and we're not going to navigate it treating people in humane. You know the worst thing that happened to us last year is the damn media. They keep stirring the pot. The media is your biggest problem. The state can make sure that we let the people of Atlanta Beach know we will help them in every way to strengthen their community. But we are not going to promote any events going forward that do any harm to the citizens of South Carolina. Myrtle Beach is totally dependent upon minority tourism. It is time for that bike bus to come to an end. Okay, so we can get back on that. I know you know you was talking about your friend. You got a little choked up. Right. You know, it's just uh, you know God put these people in my life to to help me get to where I'm at today. And I thank you again for having me and you know supporting me because you've been a great support. You know, um, we just have to stick together. You know, and tell these stories. I tell people all the time. Mm -hmm. There's so many stories out here. All you have to do is pick up a camera and tell them, you know, just write it out. And as long as it's interesting to other people besides just you, you know, just because your grandma cooked good chicken and had a, a, a long life might not necessarily make a story. But if she's got some interesting things that's happened in her life, you know, um, you can tell her story. You know, just there's just so many stories out here. So, you know, I just appreciate the connection, you know, that we've that we've had, you know. You know, it was so funny, um, you know, how we met, and it was like after we did meet, it's like, you know, we just connected, you know, me you, and, and your, you know, your wife. So I definitely appreciate that, and I appreciate you, um, you know, reaching out, saying if, you know, if you need me, I'm here for you, you know, and I just want to thank you, you know, for that as well. But um, let's see, we, um, I wanted to ask you about, um, how did you pick, like, some of the people that you were, you know, that you interviewed? Well, I wanted to tell the main characters in the story. I knew that the mayor, of course, was a big character, the mayor of, of Myrtle Beach, the mayor of Atlantic Beach, uh, all the officials, as many officials that I could, you know. Uh, you had the NAACP that come down every year and monitor this event because of the harassment and some of the unequal treatment that we've experienced. Shout out to Anson Osaka. He's the uh, lead counsel of the National NAACP. 
he's in this film. And, you know, he's been fighting for years trying to get this traffic pattern down and trying to uh, just get better conditions because a lot of the restaurants, um, they don't want our business. So they'll either oh, shut down yeah. or they'll give a service that we, we don't want. You know, we've had, and that's what brought the NAACP down there. They had uh, uh, one particular restaurant that closed their doors during bike week, the front doors. And they were selling their food out of the drive through window. Like you had to walk up to the drive through to get your food. And what it was, it's just reminiscent of, you know, back in the day when we used to have to go to the back door to get our food and stand up and eat it, you know. And this is 2000, you know, 10, 12, and they're, they're still treating us like this. And um, so Anson Osaka and the NAACP sued um, this particular restaurant and won. Friendly's, that's the name of it. But, um, and they had a couple of hotels that were giving us, um, that, that were involved in the lawsuit. And I interviewed Anson and several other motorcycle clubs, um, just anybody that would be tied to this event. Citizens, I have a historian, Mr. John Skeeter from Atlantic Beach. He's now been he there. Well, right? Right. right. Mr. Skeeter okay. has a hotel. He's a lifelong resident of Atlantic Beach and um, he gave a lot of insight. Of course, the mayor, um, Mr. Evans, gave a lot of insight and history of Atlantic Beach. And I just wanted to tell, like I said, both sides of the story, not just the partying and the fun and, and that type of thing and the harassment. I wanted to give us some history so, you know, we'll know. And, and we have to acknowledge our history. So, it, like, back in the day, you know, thinking about the bike rally, like, I couldn't even remember seeing... Like the police that, I didn't even know they had that many police until now. But, you know, back in the day, when we were just on that one street, you didn't have all that. You know, you didn't have all the police around. And, you know, like I said, it was just, it was just like a, a big party. You know, it was just a big party. No prejudice, no nothing. Well, in 2014, unfortunately, we had, they had a shooting. It was an incident involved. Mm -hmm some young kids that were beefing on Facebook. And when they ran into each other, they weren't bikers, they weren't riders, they were just some kids that go to the bike We, you know. And they had a shootout right on the strip, and that's when the governor got involved. That's when things really, that's when the roadblock came the next year in 2015, the 23 mile traffic pattern. So they used that as a catalyst to really shut us down. They bring in 700 police officers, excuse me, 500, because uh, Myrtle Beach has 200 of its own officers. Mm -hmm. They have 700 police officers, and you can't go, you know, 800 yards without seeing a police officer, real, literally, especially on the strip. They are just completely, it's just a lockdown city. And doing my research for this, I talked to some of the other police states, uh, police uh, departments, and one was in Florida, um, in um, what's the beach, uh, Daytona Beach, and they do police in a totally different way, right? They will have 200 officers, but they'll be staged off the strip, and they have four officers walking the strip, so people can enjoy themselves and have a good time and not feel harassed. But if something were to jump off, they got these cops on standby, which is, you know. I don't have a problem with that, but this just this this constant harassment and 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 over policing, you know, and understand if you go down there and act a fool, you go into jail. Period. And that's and I don't I don't have a problem with that, but when you're uh, making it uncomfortable with someone like me or yourself to just coming down for the weekend, and we don't have we're grown people, we work, we ride expensive bikes, we come down and spend top dollar because they jack up the room rates the week that we get there. The room goes from ninety nine dollars the week before. Now it's two eighty nine with a three day minimum. With a three day minimum, and um, it's just they they just they explored us. They they want our money, and that's not to say that all of the people in Atlantic or uh, Myrtle Beach are bad people. You know, and the mayor I appreciate who he's he's going now. John Rose lost his election this year. Hopefully we can get changed now with the new administration that's in here. But, um, you know, he told me himself basically that, you know, if we leave, they'll find another group. 
It may take them a couple of years, but they'll bring in the LPGA or another group of people and they'll keep it moving. So um, we have to do something, you know. Um, and some people want to boycott and some people want to just, and some people don't care. They just like, hey, I just want to go down there for the fun. But I, I just wanted this film to bring attention to the situation that we have. You know, you make up your own mind of what you want to do. But um, if I don't see giving people our money that don't want our money, you know, or don't deserve our money. So we have to be accountable for that as, as, as a community. So this film has gotten a lot of attention. You know, I think just, you know, the trailer itself. Like you say, the, the, the title speaks for itself. So where do you see yourself taking this trailer, you know, taking this movie five years from here, you know, maybe 10 years, just, you know, in the future? Where do you see this movie going? Well, we've had a lot of good uh, support on Facebook. We had almost 4 million views on the trailer. Um, we, we've done film festival, went to the New York Hip Hop Film Festival, Kukulora's Film Festival um, this summer. That's how I got this deal. We, um, we First, we went the year before as a work in progress. And I want to shout out to Dan Brawley and the Kukulora's family because they took us in, you know, when I only had 13 minutes of footage, you know, and they was like, well, we're going to help mold you and help guide you and push you to, to make this film, you know, to complete this film. So we came back this year, and it was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. They've been having a festival for 26 years, and never before had they offered a second screening because our first one sold out so fast that they had to book a screening the next morning. At 10 in the morning, there was 350 people out there. So there's a lot of excitement. We got. They said we were the best movie out of 300 movies in the film festival, and we just... It was just a lot of hard work and, and, and like I said, remaining true to yourself and, and keeping that vision and not, you know, not giving. I knew how I wanted it. And mm -hmm. with the help of David Iverson, my editor, um, we brought it to fruition. But it was a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. A lot of money. And you could have easily <laughs> said, you know, no, I'm tired. I'm not going to do this. But, you know, giving help is not an option. You, know, you didn't quit. Tell us some of the things that you have going, you know, getting ready. That's coming up for you. Okay, because of the Kuk our success at Kukulores, uh Hollywood called, you know, and a distribution company, Gravitas Ventures, offered us a um, a deal to distribute our, our film, and we're excited about that. It pushed back my, because at first I wanted to drop the movie on Thanksgiving during the holidays, and when the Gravitas deal came about, so we could be on, like, a hundred different platforms, brought into a hundred million homes, you know. Also, we had a British company uh, from London call us. Um, they wanted to distribute us overseas. So it's been a wild ride. So we, we're almost there. We just got you know a few months of trying to work out the deal and the advertising. But around bike uh, around bike week, the movie will be available on every platform imaginable. You know, so um, we're excited about that. It's a blessing. Yes. You say how long does that process last? I mean, I mean, take the the process of like actually, you know. Yeah, the distribution process takes like six months. It's um, you know, when you're dealing with Hollywood, you you know, it's, they don't just drop it, pick it up, and record it, and then send it out. It's just a long process, and we have different um things that we have to meet over every month. Um, providing the film, providing the insurance, providing all the things so when it's time to drop it, it'll be ready on all those platforms. You was talking about that insurance. It sounds like my liability insurance to be a doctor. It's like <laughs> crazy. You and you you know, you would never even guess that um, it was that expensive. Thought, yeah. Right. The insurance is uh, you know it's called errors and omissions insurance and it's like if somebody's in the background of your movie and they never signed a waiver to be in the movie, and they said, hey, I don't want to be in that movie, you know, and they can just sue now because they mm -hmm. just happen to be in the background of the movie. So mm -hmm. that insurance protects you against that. And this, you know, it's an expensive process, but um, we're almost there. Um, we have a, uh, the Haytai Film Festival coming up um, the 15th through the 17th. That's in Durham, North Carolina. We're doing a fundraiser for that. And we're also um, doing another fundraiser the following week at the Cat's Cradle, which is in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Wow, awesome. So, I mean, 
I'm glad that you came today because, you know, you really inspired me. I, I want to go ahead and get my um, documentary film completed as well so I can kind of put that chapter, you know, right. close that book and start on something else. <laughs> so we have a few more minutes. Is there any, like, little last-minute um, things that you want to talk about? You know, maybe some other things that, you know, you look forward to doing, you know, in the future? or um, We're... Um our next project, uh, my wife and I, or my wife and my daughter, is going to do a documentary about chitlins. Um, I know people aren't, you know, like chitlins, really, but uh, there's, a, there's a history with chitlins. You know, people don't know that, you know, that um, master, you know, our slave owners of, mm -hmm. for our, of our ancestors, they would give us, you know, the scraps give us the feet, the ears, the tail, the stuff that they didn't want, the entrails, the guts. Um, we just it, it shows our perseverance as a people to be able to turn something bad, you know, into something so good to me. Now a lot of people <laughs> like the doc here don't like chitlins. You know, I love them, you know, yeah. but uh, you know, there's a divide in our community. Should we oh. or should we not eat chitlins? You know, so I just think that's an interesting story that we'd like to do a little short on and involve my daughter in, and um, we're working on that. And um, there's, there's several stories that I have, you know, that we're writing them out, and hopefully, you know, one day it can get not just a distribution deal, but a production deal, um, because there's so many stories out here that I think that, that you guys in our community, you know, would, lo would love. So that's our show, you all. We want to thank you for joining in Life Men tonight. I'm thank so honored you. to have you thank on you my platform. Having... Share with share on the platform with you. So you can catch my show right here on the Wake Up Call Network every Wednesday. And when I say growing, man, we are growing. They said uh, 29 million homes. I said that's wrong. I'm thinking more like 50 million. But <laughs> I'm just going to set the bar high. And, you know, we're, um, we increase the radio stations as well. So... Um, that's my show. Check me out. Watch my show every Wednesday. And thank you for joining us. And join us here every Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks.